Hello, hello. Hello. <laughs> Aloha, mingalaba. Good to see everybody. <laughs> Remember to take the time to uh, receive your Sangha, a couple pages, four. <laughs> As a matter of fact, four, yeah. Wow, so good to see you. Hope oh, everybody nice. is are good. Yeah, that three and one over there with Jessica. Are you all in Kalikikua now, or is that right? Oh, sorry, I think you're muted. Probably. Let's see. No, we heard you. I think <laughs> I did. <laughs> yeah, I was in Captain Cook for a while, but actually, we're we're in Costa Rica right now. <laughs> hey. Yeah. All right. Cool. <laughs> well, welcome. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Oh, oh to see Japan. Wow, so much fun. East Coast, West Coast, Canada. Yeah. Midwest. <laughs> Meeting. All right, everyone. Well, wonderful to see you. Hope it's good to see each other. So we'll take some time for our meditation practice. To find my bell. Mm. So just as usual, finding a seated posture that feels more or less comfortable and stable for you. For the next little bit of time. Maybe letting your eyes come to close. Just to help kind of create that gentle sense of a container of quietude, helping the attention settle inwardly. And taking the time to, in a very relaxed way, just receiving, noticing, whatever sensations or phenomena we notice arising and passing in the body, in the heart, mind, the sense experiences of all kinds. seeing to what degree we might just recognize that we don't have to do anything with what we're noticing, with all the phenomena that enter the field of our awareness. They arise and pass on their own. The mind has the ability to observe this. Accept it. 
understand the lessons that are to be gleaned from that. And of course, we see the mind getting involved based on preference, liking or not liking, disinterest, wanting, aversion. We can observe the actions of the mind as well. It's included in that which we don't have to manipulate, adjust, perfect. can learn a lot by watching the mind contract around certain objects, certain ideas, fantasy, physical experiences. Understanding the security that it feels like it's getting, the solidity, the identity, stability in these ever-changing conditions. Also the pain of trying to control of distance from the unfolding reality. And so it can be helpful to encourage the mind to relax from its habitual contractions. and bring the attention more coherently around certain other aspects of what's happening in our experience. That might be less evocative, that are readily available, and discernible. Sometimes it's just inviting the attention to receive the stream of sound. Changing phenomena at the ear door. Watching the mind conjure a world around us based on these sounds. And then relaxing into just the simple receiving of the tones and vibrations at the ear. The same way the attention can come into the field of physicality. The same receptive relationship. The phenomena arising and passing out of our control.
phenomena of the mind will grab onto, get involved with, identify with, cling and reject, conceptualize. You can see that urge for solidity. Appreciate part of the mind and heart that feels like it needs that. And come into a deeper trust in the mind's capacity to be with these phenomena without all of that pressure, tingling, hardness, softness. Motion, stillness. Coolness, warmth. Cohesiveness. Dissipation. Sometimes this field of the whole body can seem too wide, too much going on. So we can narrow that field to just the area of the hands. Or the area around the abdomen. as we notice the rising and falling sensations of the breath. Of course, the mind will notice other phenomena will wander in whatever direction it's more interested in. Get stuck in whatever loops it feels compelled to. These are not outside of our practice, not obstacles, or intrusions. The invitation is always to observe and try to understand. When we have the intention to observe sound, body sensation, breath, that intention lasts only a moment before a new intention arises, maybe similar, may draw the mind elsewhere. Remembering that what we call concentration is not just locking something into the attention and maintaining it in a fixed way. but the persistent and repetitive arising of the intention to observe. So we try to keep remembering to observe. But of course, other intentions will arise. And each moment, the new opportunity. To gather the attention, to observe, and try to understand what's happening between body and mind, 
mind and mind. Mind and body. As best we can.
Thank you, Jesse. Nice to get quiet. It's really good to see you, you are. It feels um, pretty timeless to me at the moment. I feel like I was just uh, seeing all of you. <laughs> so so uh, it's great again to see you all. The, um, the talk is about finding peace, <clears throat> but also um, about karma or karma. And I'm going to begin with a poem by, a uh, late poem by Wang An Shi. And um, he lived from 1021 to 1086 in China. And perhaps because it is a talk about Kama, um, he, he is a very remarkable uh, being in that he had the ear of the emperor for many years in China and he uh, was prime minister, chief advisor and policy maker. And he really cared about people. And he really cared about um, a happy and prosperous uh, population, not, not just for a few. He, so he brought in so many reforms on so many levels. I can talk about it some more, but just amazing what he managed to do for people. And uh, he always wanted to practice meditation. And so he felt at some point that things were in place and that he felt that they would be carried through. So he retired to practice meditation. And then a little while later, of course, um, there are some people who did not want that way of life for many people. Uh, and it got so bad, <laughs> like what he had accomplished was so un unwoven. And then on top of it, the, the um, so-called invasion started from the north. In those days, they called them the barbarians. But um, he was blamed for all of it. He was blamed for everything, all the catastrophes. Uh, and I, I find his poems very moving uh, because of that, that he was practicing through that um, period of being sh so shamed. Uh, for trying to do such good. So this is not one of those poems. I'm beginning with um, one of his very quiet meditation poems. It's called At the Shrine Hut on Eightfold Integrity River. Alone in recluse quiet can be enough. Reality absolute itself, such clear joy. And mountains never hold eyes back. River sounds never grate against ears. Suddenly, there's nothing at all to be. What I am now, I am, and am, and am. And I, I really want you to take in that suddenly there's nothing at all to be. It's like, you can't make that happen but it happens, nothing to get rid of, nothing to get. And it, it's a real sense of just dropping into how things are with great trust and peace. If one is going to talk about kama, one has to talk about sankharas. And uh, I wanted to just focus on one aspect today on, on sankharas, which is the, them being defined as all formations. So anything formed, that it's called that which has been put together <clears throat> and that which puts together. It's all conditioned phenomena. It includes all things, whatever in the world, all phenomena of existence. And there's a small version of a chant I like 
a lot since I was 1975, since I first heard it. <clears throat> and it means all conditioned things, all, all sankharas, all conditioned things are arising and passing away. Understanding this brings the greatest kind of happiness, which is peace. Anicca vata sankara upato vaya jamino upakitu va niruchanti desam upasumo suko. And if we went on, you can you can start it with after anicca impermanence vata sankara dukkha vata sankara anatta vata sankara but though we'll start with the anicca vata sankara all formations are impermanent right all conditioned things are arising and passing away and it, it's just this beautiful simple description of what happiness in the, the buddhist context is it's a happiness of peace it's un, it's understanding that that's what we're all born into every being that takes birth whether we're a whale or a fish or a human being an, an ant all beings are without a permanent self So if we start to kind of, um, as we probe this on deeper and deeper levels, as we practice, we start to see that we cannot trust well unless we completely accept this changeability that we all share, this utter moment-to-moment -moment flux. So when we have this... Um, unconditional acceptance that we don't know what's going to happen next, right? This is the crux of it. It's like that, that this unpredictability is happening moment by moment. If we totally accept that, if we, we have a quiet abiding with that understanding that that's how things are, um, <clears throat> we can trust that we don't have to control how things are because we understand that we can't. So it's that simple. When we understand that we can't control that, then there's this just dropping into the trust of um, being connected with the unpredictability moment by moment. So what we tend to do because we're afraid of that unpredictability, we shuttle back and forth between the past and the future. It's like that's our way of trying to feel safe, as Jesse was saying in his instructions. And there's this expectation and memory and agenda um, and planning all, all to try to feel safe um, rather than the choice sometimes to be able to just get it like, oh, yeah, it's unpredictable. It's OK, it's okay. because that's how it is. So sometimes in practice, um, equanimity arises, and that, that's a factor of in awakening, which is this unconditional acceptance of how things are. And so what we, that means without conditions, we're not putting a condition on it. It's like, oh, no, not sadness. I thought I got rid of that. Or, you know, that's been going on too long. Or, oh, no, I couldn't. I, that sound that's outside happening again or whatever, you know, oh, no, I'm sleepy, whatever it is. It's like this equanimity is the opposite of that. This, the equanimity is like, oh, oh, it's OK. Because it's happening. So this this what's confusing about this is that it doesn't mean unconditional without conditions does not mean that we're condoning how life is or that it's right it has nothing to do with that it has to do with the fact that it's happening and what are we going to do about that fight it or be at peace
Uh, so the um, unfolding of sankharas, the unfolding of the kama, um, when, when we look at what can be so hard, because we say anicca, the flux, the flux of the change, um, we're born into a world of pain and pleasure and neutral. Right, that, that, that we're really where it's difficult is that pleasure passes and pain arises. And of course we can move the furniture around a little bit in life, but inwardly and outwardly, uh, uh, most of it is out of our control. And it doesn't mean, can, this unconditional acceptance does not mean that we don't try to change things. So that's, that's a misunderstanding. It, it's just that, that on the level of peace, the, the, the movement toward change isn't coming out of um, fighting, but out of peace. The motivation is out of loving kindness or out of compassion. You see the difference. It's it. So this is, again, you get to start seeing that it all comes down to motivation. And the, the more equanimity, the clearer the motivation. So this, this vast range of joy and sorrow that we're born into, uh, often when we hear the word kama or karma, we'll bring in our past, oh, our, it's almost like our religious conditioning or philosophical conditioning, but there's a way in which um, a lot of us were conditioned to hear karma and think immediately punishment and blame. That, that we make it very simplistic especially when it's painful. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh no, I have such bad karma because this is happening. And it's just like uh, very interesting how we do that. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna read a poem again. Whoa. This is, um, I'll be reading the poems of Wayne Anshi. This is called Following Prosper, Bright Gathers Rhymes. These titles are awesome. It's very windy, so I'm putting things on top of my papers. Lost to my country. Lost to my country, I'm living on Bell Mountain. Green pines, courtyard walls, rooms. The monasteries hidden among sunlit mist. Here, sound itself reveals Buddha nature perfectly. This wind, whispering, then wailing. Streams hushed, then tumbling. Ah, oh, like there it is. What we're born into, the, the whispering, the wailing, the hush, the tumbling. So we often hear of the um, word lokadama. Lokadama means the um, vicissitudes of life, the four um, are gain, loss, pain, pleasure, joy, sorrow, fame, disrepute. It's like we're all born into this world of change. And of course, we all prefer, <laughs> we don't prefer disrepute, right? We don't prefer loss, we don't prefer sorrow, right, or pain, but it's like that's actually the way of the world. Lokadama is the way of the world. So we can actually connect and abide in this deep unconditional acceptance of Lokadama, of this Sankharas and you know the Kama unfolding. And the, the way that equanimity works with this is that it allows us to accept that we're all living out our karma together. 
and it, it's individual and collective. So, I mean, you can, you can really appreciate that maybe India is living out a certain comma right now, right? Or that you personally might have experienced something today or yesterday individually that you're living out your comma. Like it, but it's like the more that we accept that that's actually what we're doing. That's the practice. And that there's a possibility of finding more and more peace with that. And actually having, the more you accept that, the more there's a flexibility of response, less and less need to control it. And more of like, you learn more and more ways in meditation practice to be flexible in that process and to be more helpful, not only with yourself, but with every being you meet. And there's, I think there's something amazing about that, right? There's something amazing that we can all approach life that way. And, and so the teachings, you know, there's so much to say about this. I'll probably need a, at least a part too, but um, most of us understand that when we identify with our experience as being referring back to a me or I or mine or a you, or yours or ours, that it's that it's that belief in that identification that it's mine, like my knee pain or my fear or your anger. It's like your thoughts, my thoughts, it's all that rather than again that sense of what Jesse was trying to get across today, where there's this arising and passing away. And it really is just like being a weather front. It's like if you, if you can really be, how many people can actually be with a cloud that appears out of nowhere and just comes and unfolds and disappears? That, that that's how it all is. And it's, that's how insubstantial it all is. Take a look at a thought. Take a look at another one. Try to find on your hand right now, try to find something really substantial that's lasting moment by moment. It's like a sound, a thought, a smell, a taste, a touch, an emotion. They don't last. And so that the this is what I don't have that much time to go into, but it, it's, it's to get a sense that um, over time, you, you really start to not want to create more karma, whether it's good or bad, like whether it's, it's, it's gonna, it's like you just don't want to continue samsara. You just get sick of greed, hatred, and delusion as a motivating force in life. And it's a lot of it is just we're not sick enough of it. It's sickening in terms of a motivating force. Because how much what do we how much do we really need? Really? And it's so sad because it's really just the little me that's afraid of the unpredictability. Yeah, it's just like, I want, I want. It's like, I like it when I see baby birds being born at spring in Hawaii and you, you see these little baby birds and they're going squawk, squawk, squawk. It's like, yeah, okay, you know, I'm 69. Do I really need to be doing that? <laughs> Well, I might do it, but I tend to relate to it like that, you know, it's like, well, maybe not, you know, it's like you have to have some humor with it, too. It's not, it's not, just, it's like, it's sickening when we don't see it clearly. If we see it clearly, it's just like a cloud passing through. It's just wanting, it's just fear, it's just anger, you know, it's, but we can take it all so seriously, you know. And I take great comfort in a, the one of the great Buddhist stories about um, 
a monk named Angulimala, who just was uh, when he before he was a monk, and he he had a garland of fingers of people he killed. Like I, it's a long story, but just can you imagine wearing a garland? Mala, he had a, he wore all the fingers of the people he killed. <laughs> it was like a kind of awesome, you know, kind of action movie kind of story. It's full of blood and murder, and uh, he he needed one more to fulfill the prophecy. To, he needed one thousand one, I think he was on. He needed a certain amount, and uh, he was going to kill a Buddha. That's not good karma. But um, the Buddha sensed him coming and um, the Angulimala was chasing him and chasing him. And uh, the Buddha uh, made it happen so that he could never catch up. And Angulimala got so frustrated. And finally he yelled out, stop, stop monk, stop. And the Buddha turned around and he said, I have stopped. And that story always makes me cry because it's like so beautiful. He he caught he caught him. The Buddha the Buddha got him to understand. In that moment, Angulimala understood, and he just like I said, there's a certain point where you want to stop, and he stopped. And he became fully enlightened, uh, really did it. No more greed, hatred, and delusion. And, um, but that didn't mean that he didn't have that Lokadama reputation, right? Fame, disrepute. And when he would go out on arm from, people would chide him and taunt him and throw things at him and really hurt him. He had to live out that karma. And that this is it. It's like even fully enlightened beings have to live out their karma of this lifetime, but they're not creating anymore. They've stopped. So I say, let's just all just live it out. It's like I, if you see, like if you drop something that rolls like a little ball and you drop it and it rolls until it stops. That's how I see it. You just like we have that lifetime that will just unfold and then it can be over, really over. And the, I think that when we have really hard times, which we all do, um, I've had so many that I can give this, I'll give one example. I was in a car accident once and um, had a, a lot of whiplash and pain. And the <laughs> next day after the, uh, car accident, I'll have this happen where I'll be thinking, I have such bad karma, <laughs> I have such bad karma, <laughs> poor me, poor me, and then there'll be a certain point, because I've been this through enough of hard times, I'll think, oh, wait a minute, I'm trying to figure out why, why, why did this happen, and when I'm trying to figure out why this happened, it's all in the head, it's all conceptual, and it's resisting the pain. Anytime you're trying to like rail against like the, what's going, cool? why is this happening? Why is this happening? It's just, it's not like bad or wrong. It's just I call it figuring, trying to figure it out. But when there's a certain moment when you go, go like what's really going on, and usually it's like whoa, this really hurts. I'm like wow, this hurts. Wow, I don't want to be with this. We don't have to figure out why like the buddha taught that the unfolding like these sankaras unfolding moment by moment the conditions are unfathomable unfathomable and we'll usually turn it into i am good like or i am bad or that person is blaming self-blame blaming 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 something versus just take responsibility for the comma unfolding. How you do that isn't by taking it personally, it's by dropping into the non-conceptual. And maybe we, as again, in Jesse's instructions, maybe we notice hardness or tightness or tension or 
fear, you know, it's like you, you try to be mindful, you know, the recognition, acceptance, interest, non-identification, rain, you apply the, at least to see, is resisting this pain okay? Because that's so important. We think, oh, I should accept this pain, accept the Lokadama, accept whatever's happening in the planet or within ourself um, without allowing that, of course, there are many, many moments where we, we can't. And that that's not only totally okay. Again, you can't control it. If your system's going, no, I can't be with this, what are you going to do? Crush it? Right? What are you going to do but respect it with all the kindness in your heart? And that's what brings trust. That's how you can start to find more and more peace with living out karma. Because if you respect resistance, your system's going to start collaborating with you. Heaven forbid, huh? That there's some collaboration happening versus the, the fight. And it's wonderful when our system just goes, wow, she's going to like actually respect me. Maybe even some reverence, reverence for resistance eventually will lead to acceptance. And there's that great description of if you have a flower bud and you want to open to something difficult that's happening, but you're not ready, and you start pulling the petals open, the flower dies. You kill it. So we make the connection with the resistance, not try to get <clears throat> to what you think you should be getting to. Right? You, you really have that gentle, kind approach and reverence for how the comma unfolds. And resistance is part of the comma unfolding. There's always something else to pay attention to. There's six sense doors. <laughs> Things happening at them all the time. If you can't be with something, there's always like a sound or body sensation, or there's some loving kindness. It, it's a lot of options. So we take care, we take care of the resistance. That's part of accepting karma. And eventually if we rest, it's really that sense of like being, when I'm saying there's options, but resting the attention, that deep rest of being with the breath or rest of just being with sound or rest of being kind, Eventually, the, the energy and the courageous energy will come back and some interest will happen. Genuine, genuine interest, not fake. And that's called the deep delight in the truth. Sometimes you have to wait a long time. Sometimes you need a lot of rest. This retreat that I did at the beginning, I needed a, a lot of rest. I think sometimes, not everybody would, but sometimes we can weep with relief that we can be interested in the parts of life that we dislike in ourselves and others. So we, if we can be, get that rest and be interested in dislike or hate or shame or fear, all these things that we've been trained to disconnect from and leave ourselves abandoned and alone with those experiences. Uh, we'll really start getting a sense that we can find more and more peace, that it's really possible, that we're not, it's without conditions so that we're not, when we try to rip the petals open um, and we see that, it, that it's killing, killing the heart, 
And we don't do that with anyone else anymore, right? It's the less you do it to yourself, then the less you're going to do it to other people and have an idea how they, they should open. Um, there's more and more possibility to be just with what is, not what we're trying to get or, or get rid of. Yeah, and I, I'm not going to go into what a karmic knot is too much, but you know the places in ourselves that are really difficult that we have a lot of shame about and that we have a like a learned resistance from very young. It's like when, the, when that experience comes up, we slam the door on it and it, we have to get that we learned it. We learned to slam the door on it. We find it unacceptable to experience. Those karmic knots, um, the degree to which we can be kind for them, the degree to which we can com be compassionate, grateful, and have great equanimity with, the degree to which we will not feel like we have to get rid of them to be free. And you'll be freer and freer because of that. And the degree to which you feel like you cannot be kind or compassionate or appreciative or equanimous with them, the degree to which you will not be protected and you will try to get rid of them. And so that's the flexibility on a deep level that that, again, the degree to which you can learn that for yourself, the degree to which you'll apply that to other, other people, all beings, not just the people you like or family, but again, all, all the beings on the planet we share, including mosquitoes and ants frogs, sharks, all the beings. So as you understand karma, you know, unfolding, that Sankara is unfolding the conditions, just like weather that's happening moment by moment, sounds, thought, smells, taste, touch, thought, emotion, like this um, mixed plate, as they say in Hawaii, <laughs> of phenomena. Um, you'll actually start having um, a sense that living out our karma means that every moment is our teacher. The guru is the next moment. And you, uh, Nisargadatta, this great teacher from India in the book I Am That, he said, let the future come to you. Oh, what a relief. Let the future come to you. Next moment, next moment, next moment. Let it come to you. Let it come to you, and that's your teacher. And the next moment, oh, that's my teacher. Oh, that's my teacher. That's how we live out karma. <laughs> we don't always like our teachers. <laughs> Sometimes we like them so much, we don't want the next moment, but it's like that's the way it goes. I'm gonna try to do two more things. Uh, I had a wonderful teacher named Deepama in my early years of practice from India that um, was said to be a saint, free of greed, hatred. She still had more work to do, she said, and uh, but it was very. It was like a fragrance of peace and metta 
deep fragrance. I had the opportunity to take care of her, which was wonderful. And um, I was thinking of her yesterday and remembering that one of her practices she taught, which was um, cultivating the spirit of blessing. And she used to bless everything. She'd bless stones, she'd bless a car, she'd, she blessed everybody, everything and without any um, partiality. She really did it. She had boundless metta, unconditional metta. She, you wouldn't feel like if she was giving a blessing to the person next to you. Somehow you could never even feel jealous. Like it was just like, it was so pure. And you knew she'd give you a shower just the same as the next person. And it was so weird because it was impersonal. It wasn't personal at all, but it was just like so clean everyone her daughter her granddaughter someone that she'd never met all the same blessing she had cultivated this so strong i knew that this was her practice you could tell it was her practice but i remembered she said to cultivate that spirit of blessing if you bless those around you this is what will inspire you to be attentive every moment And she was a knockout, like a knockout, knockout. So, you know, there's different ways to talk about the practice, but can you imagine wanting to live out your karma well, to, be, to try to be a, a mindful through blessing every being you come in touch with, that that's your practice. And it showed, I have to say that it really showed for her, her, she walked the talk completely. So many, much flexibility in terms of how we get inspired to get through a day to navigate our lives. I'm going to end with the today's a Wang on Shi Day. Uh, chance, part one, work failing. I'm shamed by my image in water. And now world, world dust fills my eyes again. It's grief to see mountains. Smoke and haze, all boundless silence south of the river. There isn't much keeping me here among people's houses. Part two. Dawn lights up the room. I close my book and sleep dreaming of Bell Mountain and full of tenderness. How do you grow old living with failure and disgrace? Stay close to the cascading creek, cold, shimmering. So we have a little bit of time for uh, questions. If anyone has any questions about your practice, about the instructions, about what Michelle's offered. Um, the easiest way for us is at, at the bottom of your screen, um, you should have a little button there that says reactions. And if you click on that, there should be a raise hand option. 
If not, you can look over in the participants, like kind of chat section over there or participant section. Sometimes there's under more, there's a raise your hand option, or you can just type into the chat that you have a question and we'll call upon you. Hi, Suzanne. I think you can unmute yourself. Um, thank you both so much. Um, Michelle, last weekend, you said something about inhabiting resistance in your body, learning how to do that. And it seems really connected to what you just talked about. Um, for me, the connection between knowing and feeling like when I'm resisting, I know it's okay. I'm just being human. Like it's totally okay. But to actually inhabit that. So can you just say a little more, please? It's slippery. You see, this is the crux. If you look at how much you're actually in the present moment, moment by moment, and you kind of do an honest self-assessment, um, then you'll see that that we are actually are resisting a lot, and we don't we don't want to see it. So you know you can imagine how long if you just take one lifetime, how long we've built up these protections, right? And so that our system. That's why I talk about it in relationship to trust, because if we're not really genuinely interested in the experience of resistance, our system is not going to show it to us. Why would it? It's been protecting us. If you just take, if you believe in one lifetime, it's been doing everything it can to protect us until we finally make a decision to try to develop some wisdom, right? Until we finally think, oh, maybe I could try being mindful of this, I, I'm, tr I'm not, I'm just going somewhere with you because I'm trying to describe why it's so hard. And so if we don't have that relationship with ourselves, with our, with the resistance itself, and we, if we don't have that genuine interest, I recommend not trying to inhabit it. Because your system isn't going to trust you. Your system knows it's not genuine, right? Your system's going, whoa, what a fake, right? This is, yeah, right. You're interested in shame, right? No, you're not. And just be honest, it's, it's fake. And that's not developing any kind of relationship of trust. But if you get to that, like the layer of resistance is fascinating. I'm finding it more and more fascinating, but not always interested, right? You know, so it's that, but for me, it's particularly for me, it's in the back of my neck. It's just like, that's, that's where it is. I'm not saying it's, that's where it is in everybody, but um, I've learned enough about my body and my mind to know that if I'm going to start attempting to kind of let the attention very gently, and this is not, um, you don't do it with a heavy hand. You don't do it to pounce on it and you don't do it to get rid of it. You're doing it to go, usually it takes incredible gratitude, like incredible appreciation. It's like you're down on your knees saying, thank you. Thank you, body, mind for protecting me in this world that's so hard to navigate, right? Do you see what I mean? That, that it takes that kind of total shift of, wanting to get rid of it because you want to get to you know you genuinely want to get to what's underneath it right and get rid of that <laughs> so so you know it's just like layers of resistance but it's really i love that you're asking it because that's where that's right that's when you start getting that you can actually be inside the body in wherever way or outside looking at it what uh, observing it from the outside or inside, I tend to do both. I tend to go in a little, come out and look, go in a little, then go to some sounds, go to some pleasant something, come back, metta. It's, it's really a very gradual, gentle process. 
And that's where trust, that's where real trust in yourself will develop. Otherwise, I would say, honestly, we don't have a relationship with ourself. That's how powerful this is and deep. Because you're, when your system says no, it means it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. We don't like no. <laughs> yeah, thank you. The language of trust, reverence, gratitude, interest, and also just honesty about, uh-uh, not today. Right, right. Right, and that's it. That's the most important one because most of the time it's no. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, it's like the patience that this takes is extraordinary. But I have to assure you that the more you have that patience and you don't have that agenda with it, that the, the trust will develop. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you yeah. very much. Yeah. Jesse, did you have any? Jesse, did you have any? No, that's okay. 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 Hi, everyone. Hey. Um, what does blessing mean? Um, when Deepama is saying she blesses being all being, what does blessing mean? Well, she was really good at it. So um, <laughs> she, it, it's metta, it's compassion. It's like, um, but she would use her hands and she would, if you're standing there, she would just sort of either, if she felt like she, you didn't want to touch her, she, for her to physically touch her, she was very sensitive and gentle, but she either would sort of lug, lightly brush you or outside of your body kind of brush, kind of brush outside your body and just be saying a few words of metta. It was very, it's very nice. And it's, again, I think it reminds me of the happy Sayada who talked about metta, metta, metta. That touch is again, so foreign to us as a meditation practice, but it's, um, it's kind of fun you know, like cats and dogs really like blessings. They demand them, right? <laughs> they want far more than we want to give them. But it's like, you know, you can bless. Oh, there was a great Zen teacher. I can't remember his name, but he didn't say bless, but he said, sometimes I bow to the dust. And that, you know, it's like, it's, it's just really getting the sense of um, metta for the sky, metta for trees, metta for your car, metta for your bus, metta for the steps you walk out of your apartment in. It's, but start with easy. Is there something you would like to bless? My blanket, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Yay! Yeah. Always start with what's easy, no matter how you think about it. Hey, Molly. Hi, so thank you for the meditation, and the talk. Um, so I'm likely trying to fathom the unfathomable. <laughs> well, my talk was partly from your question last week, yeah. I thought, thank you so much. <laughs> I didn't thought it was. Um, so with, you know, with that sentence that India is living out its karma, I mean, I can think of weather and 
And the weather people here knew that six days ago there was going to be a big win today. So they knew something was happening and something else was happening. And then it would unfold into this weather. And it sometimes they're right, sometimes they're wrong. But, um, but Burma living out its karma, India living out its karma. I can accept more that we were living out our karma with Trump. But <laughs> here, here, yeah, but it's, um, I don't know, maybe it's a koan or something I need to sit with. Just it's, yeah, it's just, not, it's not condoning, it's not saying it's right, it's the fact. You see, if we can't accept the fact that it's happening, you can't respond well. It's like, you know, the difference between compassion and grief, of course, we'll feel it's beyond heartbreaking. It's beyond, we don't even know. I mean, we don't even know what's going on there. It's not being reported, but um, you can just imagine. And it's, it's to be able to have a heart that can care and accept that it's happening not that is has nothing to do with saying i it's not an agreement with how life is by any means acceptance is an agreement it's it's accepting that it's happening and then maybe we do something <laughs> i get caught it's under with judgment ahead. yeah i get caught with thinking judgment like that country is suffering because they did all these wrong things. And that's what I'm trying to say. There's a, even if you just take the Judeo Christian overlay that a lot of us have, and there's a punishing God, and I'm not trying to say that's right or wrong either. That was our karma. <laughs> <laughs> really? It's like, yeah, wow. Yahweh. Yahweh had strong energy. Um, and, but be careful of that. It just goes nowhere. Yeah. It, it's karma a, just means past action it just means yeah. like what's happening now is the result of past action so there's there's no like you don't have to it's not about blame or judgment or but though of course in the suttas or in other traditions you're gonna find things that are very much like well this person did this in the past and so this horrible thing happened like a very like a kind of mathematics like a sort of very unphilosophical kind of like rudimentary math of like moral retribution you know so i'm not even trying to say that it's not in the tradition in there and that people will that it's a thing but like there's the other sort of side of it is just to get that's like the teaching comma can mean action it can mean it, just the volitional that's part of part of what the buddha sort of how he um distinguished kind of his take on it com compared to other contemporaries it's like that it's intention right the the intentional volitional impulse behind action has a has a impact on the results of that action right on the, the 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 results and so it's all just trying to say that like whatever is happening now all the forces all the any any phenomena that is happening right now is a result of past action whether it's to say it's my action whether it's to say lifetimes or it's like all the philosophical pieces can sort of you know you can go there but like you said it's like you overthink it and it's not really going to actually get you anywhere but it's not hard to recognize that like yes Donald Trump or, you know, Black Lives Matter or all, whatever million things happening in the, you know, the United States is like when Malcolm X said, right? It's like, oh, it's chickens coming home to roost, right? It's like, yeah, the, this is like, th there, there are things that set things into motion and like now we can see the results and it's not mystical and it's not magical and it's not like that confusing actually when you sort of look at it. This question of like what's collective, what's individual, Yes, it's, you know, there's ways in which it's like it can get kind of murky, but it is also saying it's like, well, that country, it's like countries don't experience anything. Everything is experienced individually, right? It's all experienced individually. It, it, so countries don't experience things, though there are sometimes patterns and tendencies uh, in terms of dynamics of race and class and gender and all kinds of things, right, that do kind of, uh, that people have shared experiences, of course, within within a context. And then it does end up being sort of more like weather systems, you know, 
though apparently technically in the tradition weather does not come into the thing things can be the result of weather and that means they're not the result of karma that there's somehow there's like other forces at play that are not just karma so anyway you're you can take that me. into <laughs> you're confusing me <laughs> anyway it's just to say like don't have to worry about it too much you just get that yes everything that's happening now is like to some degree predictably based on like some past action you can see why this is happening now and it's definitely not to condone it it's definitely not to say oh people deserve it but there's this sense of like okay well this is what happens right this is what happens when x or y or z and the pain of that the hardship of that the possibility of that but like michelle saying this the, the sense of like oh do we do we then respond in agony sometimes but we also see then what is the comma that unfolds from that? What are the kinds of actions? What are the kinds of results that end, that ends up creating? And when we have a little more ability to bear the, the pain of like suffering, then we actually feel it. It's actually more painful to be accepting of the truth than to be angry about it. Because what it means is you're feeling the pain and you're not trying to escape from it and, and throw the pain elsewhere and have someone else feel the pain and dodge it. It's like, you're actually with a willingness to feel all the pain in life and your life and the life of the world, whatever of dukkha, of the, of the, the condition of existence is quite fathom, it's quite unfathomable, right? It's quite powerful. And it is part of the job of the yogi is to feel the intensity and to realize we have the capacity to show up for the like unrestrained and pure dukkha of existence. And in that capacity that requires so much love and so much space and so much strength and versatility and all these things, then there is the like, then the comma can end with you. You don't need to then, you know, throw it up out, out there right you don't need to kind of like get rid of it in one way or another and have lay it on other people there's a sense like oh and it comes to an end in your own heart and your own mind and then the actions predicated upon care of compassion of understanding how hard it is to bear that intensity that of course people are behaving violently behaving delusionally behaving greedily in the world because it is actually hard to bear the truth of reality and so then there's actually more capacity to, to, to interact with other people and interact with our world, the more we can bear the truth of what's happening and the, the painfulness of it, you know, as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna stay with accepting the fact that's yeah. really, yeah. And it's such an important part of equanimity. Yeah. I mean, that's it is. Sure. It is equanimity, yeah, <laughs> totally. I think I just want to add because there's so many angles to this and it would take hours, you know, to talk about. But I think um, the Buddha did describe 32 levels of existence and he put humans forth from the bottom. So, and it's very important to see that forth from the bottom in, in 32 levels. We're not considered very developed right like Deepama I would say she's one of the most developed human beings I've ever met right she's not everybody's walking around like Deepama you know and so you know you kind of when, when I was a kid I had a friend that liked to be out in the woods and nature and but she also liked to um, capture them and make little ponds and bring them in and I said I would participate if we could have them in the little things she built if we could bring them back after a few days so you know once it was turtles and then this we put them back and then she wanted to catch frogs <laughs> and we we caught little frogs big you know female frogs bullfrogs and uh, <laughs> this was so traumatic like we were we brought them to her little cool little pond that she had made. And um, as we were putting, we had put the bigger frogs in and then we were putting the little frogs in and the bullfrog ate them all, just like ate them all. And I, I let out a scream. I screamed so loud that neighbors thought a murder had happened and I got in so much trouble, but I said, but a murder did happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but a murder did really, murders happen. <laughs> I was, 
traumatized for weeks over this because I felt like I actually was a cause, right? But I also feel like it, once I got through some weeks of horror, I realized, well, this is how it is. Mm -hmm. Like the, hu the human world, you know, you don't necessarily see people eating each other quite like that, although it happens. But it's like, you have to get that the human world is not, the animal world is right underneath us considered, although some animals seem more evolved. But it's like, generally speaking, we're not, if you look at the whole picture, it's important to just have an honest assessment of the human world. And it's often much more troubling than we want, right? It's much, there's much more greed, hatred, the motivation of, this is why we practice, the motivation of greed, hatred, and delusion causes harm. The motivation of wisdom and love and kindness, compassion, appreciation and equanimity brings um, peace and love, you know, and it's like, there are kind, wise people on this planet it's, it's just that we have to remember that there's both and that, that it's really important to remember that all that we do is to try to help amplify and help all of us um, find more and more love and peace and express it. It's all we can do. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> There's some more, Cynthia. Um, and when you talk about intention, you're talking about unconscious as well as conscious intention, I assume. Because I can do something that I don't think it's harmful, but it, the, another person feels harmed by it. Mm. But it may have come from something and probably did from some kind of greed, hatred, delusion in me that I wasn't aware of or mm. even didn't. It still hurt somebody. Right. Well, I, I think it's a, I mean, it's an important point to recognize of, on one hand, I'd say in this tradition, there isn't so much the idea of uncon the unconscious or the subconscious, right? There's like, there's like the more subtly conscious, right? So, so on one hand, like all volition is something you could be aware of. Like every moment of intentionality is something that the mind can observe. Um, there's of course a lot that goes unobserved. And so okay. then exactly starts to ha starts to be operating kind of in the shadows and has consequences that we don't always foresee or don't feel responsible for or what have you, you know? Um, but that sense of like our increasing ability to see the motivation behind mental action, physical action, verbal action is part of the purification process and that, and that increasing taking responsibility for our actions um, and, and watch being vigilant, you know, for what, what kind of things are motivating it. I think the other thing is like, to be careful of like, is there in the, is this idea in the, in the tradition again, that's kind of like, not that sophisticated, right? That like all positively motivated actions are going to therefore have good consequences. And that's just not necessarily true, you know, like ever, you know, for ourselves or for another. So you really can have a pure hearted action that ends up being resulting in someone feeling harmed, right? Or being hurt or, or something 
painful happening for someone else. There's also the truth where like anybody who's an activist can know that it's like, yeah, you might go and with the most beautiful intention of heart protest in the street and it could end up in jail or killed or whatever. And so it's like, oh, you could say that that's a positively compelled action that had a negative consequence, you know? So I think the idea is like, again, it's part of that purification that like, yes, we're trying to purify the intentions, purify the actions, but we're also not attached to the outcome. We also recognize that like once they're, once it's gone and once that thing is out there, it is out of our control, you know, how it plays out. And it's going to play out in the world, not only along the lines of sort of like internal mind and matter bouncing around, it's going to play out in social dynamics, right? And so that the, the way that you'll watch an action play out over time and the world around us is not going to necessarily behave according to like Buddhist principles, you know? So that's, you know, and that's why there's this, this realization of like, oh yeah, it's not just about strategic action in the world, isn't just about our intentions, right? It's like, you can have good intent, you know, the, whatever they can say about, you know, paved with good intentions or whatever, but it's like, yeah, it's not, the, it's not, the, it's very important in terms of our own spiritual practice and development, understanding the mind and purifying our actions. And that doesn't mean that you necessarily are gonna have all of your actions, um, just like flowers blooming everywhere, you know, everywhere you step. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Does that, I don't know, Michelle, do you have anything you yeah. want to add? Yeah. That was great. It's great. Yeah. It's important. Um, thank you. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. The Buddha himself, you know, he, there's some stories that are intense about, you know, he gave a talk on, uh, you know, let it, we should be real. It's you know you can you could translate it as disenchanted with the body or disgusted with the body, right? And you can say in English those are like pretty different notions. And I don't know how it was in Pali or whatever close language they were speaking in Pali, but you know after he gave this big talk and you know disenchantment with the body and went on retreat and all these monks were like, oh my god, the body is disgusting, and they and like killed themselves. And he came out of retreat a few months later and he was like, it looks like the Sangha has diminished. And Ananda's like, yeah, after your last talk, <laughs> you know, <laughs> some people sort of took it heavy and he was like, no, you know, so this is like, you took it the wrong way. It's like mindfulness of the breath is a, you know, beautiful ambrosial dwelling. He tried to sort of like come to balance with it. So, you know, and, and, the, and this, the commentaries come up with this sort of like kind of wild interpretation of why that had to happen. It really wasn't the Buddha's terrible talk that induced these people to suicide, but you could look at it pretty straightforward and see that it's like, wow, that's, that, that was like a negative, <laughs> a negative outcome. So like very well-intentioned Dhamma and, um, and maybe a little bit of a relief that it's like that even happened to the Buddha, you know, never mind us with all of our confusion. So I do take some relief in, in that actually um, to that we have to be as careful as you can and really especially with our words you know it's not just physical gestures it's our words and and our mental activity of really seeing just like how much are we propagating delusion and anger and craving just in our our views our thoughts and the things that we're sort of churning out that can seem like they're not harming anyone in the moment you know uh, but you do you know you can really sensitize to the way and it's just like wow we really are creating this sort of fixedness in our minds and um, that can certainly harm ourselves um, and ultimately can harm others as well. Yeah. Hmm. Michelle, what do you think? In any particular well, you could, I'd, I'd listen to anything you had to say, and I'm sure we all would. Oh, on that level? Do you, do, any, do you, anything, do you think we sure should wrap it up? I'm not sure what you're referring to. <laughs> do you think we should come to a close? Anything else you want to add? I was, yeah, actually what I was, if you're asking what I was just thinking about, I was thinking about how that description of what happened 
for what the Buddha said, which I'm sure was well intentioned. Um, if that happened, you know, if it's a true story, um, that it just shows how vulnerable we are to self hatred. And um, that's what I was just thinking about that I think that whether it was 2600 years ago or now that that at the least is showing that um, I know that when I first learned the reflections of the Buddha, the four guardian meditations where um, you reflect on the qualities of the Buddha and then you, um, you, you, you reflect on the different body parts like pus, blood, bones, you know, there's 32 parts that you reflect on and then um, you do loving kindness <laughs> and then you reflect on death. And I think that um, kind of what I saw in that eventually when Jesse and I talked about it was that it was balanced, that you reflect on these beautiful qualities of the Buddha, then kind of the 32 parts of the body and then metta and then death, it's balanced, right? And so I think that um, when I asked the happy Sayado about that particular teaching, the four guardians, he just burst out laughing when I told him that, you know, that a lot of us have, when we try to do the 32 parts, this like self-hatred of the body will come up and he just started laughing. He's like, no, switch to metta. Like, no, if you don't do that one, if it like, don't, ha 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 ha, don't do it if it does that. Like, that's why it's balanced. You know, that's why you do that. But it's like, I think there is that really, um, for a lot of, a lot of us, the, um, the care and the tenderness and the pace and the patience we need to bring to the practice around that tendency toward um, self-harm through the self-hatred. So I appreciate that. That's what I was thinking about. Mm. Yeah. We all have to be so, we need so much love and kindness and compassion to balance things as they are. Uh, so I'm, I'm ready. So long. Hey, Farewell. Oh, we do think goodbye. <laughs> Bye. Blessings. Blessings. Yeah. Blessings. <laughs> Good to see you. May we live at our karma with great joy, peace, kindness. together. <laughs>